Welcome back, everyone. I had to put Jerusalem on the playlist because of the William Blake thing. Thank you. All right, we're going to get started again. So everybody, please find your seats or one like yours. And the first thing that we're going to do is, <laughs> that was good. One person yelled ship this time. <laughs> yeah, it's usually his job, but he's on stage. He doesn't get to yell. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is to give away our, uh, our custom Harvey. Our little Harveys are all made by Isolde, who is somewhere out in the blinding lights. And uh, this one has a cute little hat. It's adorable. She, thank you, yes. Um, she makes custom ones for every show that we do, which I don't know how she does that, but it's amazing. You need to provide your own sextant. <laughs> you must provide your own sextant. Okay. Uh, so we're going to give away this from the raffle tickets. So, uh, Max, can you give me that drum roll? Uh, you guys can give me a drum roll too, yeah? Good job. That's not a drum roll, Max. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Just kill it. All right. Um, Allegra Bandy. Hello. Come claim your Harvey. Come make your way past the seats somehow. Here we go. Um, we also have these reserve seats up front that have not been claimed. So if anyone wants to sit closer to the front, feel free to move on up here. And you can engage in gladiatorial combat over them if you really want to, but that's what intermission is for. All right, let's get started with uh, the next talks. Uh, we have three more people. And... For our first talk of the second half, uh, we have Andrei Silikov talking about the death of painting. Art. Art! Art! You've learned. You learned so quickly. Art and its rebels. Andre. Art. Art. Oh. The point, yeah, they give me a laser pointer, so now I am equipped. Um. <clears throat> the visual phenomena of the objective world are in themselves meaningless. When when Catalan surrealist Joan Miró said in 1927 that he wanted to assassinate painting, he was rebelling against artistic convention, which surrealism was quickly becoming a part of. Unfortunately, he was a decade late to the party. The man who killed painting was, in fact, this man. Uh, he was named Kazimir Malevich, a Russian with Polish roots, born in Ukraine. This is his self-portrait. And this was how he accomplished the feat. This is a painting of a black square on a white background, oil on linen canvas about 80 centimeters to a side. First exhibited in 1915 and called rather unsurprisingly, the black square. <laughs> Why did Malevich paint it? Why is it considered a pivotal work of avant-garde, one of the most decisive attacks on convention in the history of modern painting? Allow me to set the stage. 1910s, La Belle Epoque is coming to an end, soon to be upstaged by the nightmare of trench warfare, the alarm of revolution, the slow hangover of a generation lost. This was a time of frenzied experimentation in art, 
as the world became more industrialized, human relationships more abstract, so did art. Impressionism and post-impressionism were old. Uh, Matisse and the Fauvists were not radical enough anymore. It was a time of grand, rebellious art movements, and we can trace them by their manifestos. So, 1909, the Futurist Manifesto, and I quote, we want to demolish museums and libraries, fight morality, feminism, and all opportunist and utilitarian cowardice. Really nice guys. Um, the futurists were obsessed with speed, motion, cars, machines, all things industrial, um, which some of these you see on the painting. Um, they knew they wanted to paint something different, but how to paint it? Well, one answer was cubism, uh, a natural technique for those who seek to capture movement. Now, this painting is called The Dynamism of a Cyclist. And um, if, uh, who here sees a bicyclist in this pa painting? Raise your hands, please. All right, some, some people do. Uh, would it help if I show you this? Okay, so once again, right? Through decomposing this uh, sh shape into these curves and angles, the speed is more self-evident, right? Um, the Cubist Manifesto was published in 1912, but by then Picasso and Braque had been pushing boundaries for years, developing the idea that bodies can be decomposed into cubes, cylinders, cones, uh, f viewed from multiple angles at once. And then a year later in 1913, uh, Marcel Duchamp uh, of the infamous urinal, uh, uh, still back then a simple cubist, uh, the urinal wasn't until 1917, uh, coined the term anti-art, right? And applied it to his own work, the nude descending a staircase, which caused quite a to-do at the 1913 armory show in New York. Now, um, who here sees the nude descending a staircase? All right, lots of people. But for those who don't, right, it's a time lapse of a figure descending a staircase, right? So three years later, Duchamp will be part of the Dada movement, which was a radical group of artists united only by their lack of unity and their radical, po <laughs> their radical politics and hatred for the establishment. Um, obsessed with senseless, senselessness, rejecting logic and reason, the Dada sometimes made perfect sense. And quote, we had lost confidence in our culture. Everything had to be demolished. But, <laughs> Russia was slower to industrialize, but just as, the fev just as feverish as the rest of Europe. Only colder with stronger dichotomies and more radical radicals. The Russian avant-garde melded cubism and futurism into cubo-futurism and a dozen other movements, uh, like uh, rayonism, uh, one of my favorites. It's, it's, a, it's a bird. Um, uh, the rayonism posited that if we want to paint literally what we see, we must paint the sum of the light rays bouncing off the object. Bouncing off the object. Objects as a philosophical category were the obsession of Kazimir Malevich, uh, who was a successful artist uh, and just short, uh, a few short years progressed from Impressionism to Symbolism to Neo-Primitivism to Cubo-Futurism and Cubism and exhibited alongside of uh, Picasso in Moscow in 1913. Um, to Malevich, even the intense abstraction of uh, rayonism uh, was still an attempt to portray a thing. Though cupists and futurists decomposed objects into pieces, though they saw through the illusion of realism, they were still chained to it. And Malevich wanted to break these chains. His 1915 show was called The Last Futurist Exhibition of Paintings, 010. The new movement was suprematism, a new word and also the last word, alpha and omega. After all, the exhibition sought to nullify all art that came before to start anew. What does this mean? Well, we don't have to guess because he wrote a manifesto. 
Indeed, throughout his life, he wrote extensively and obsessively in a mad, rambling, prophetic style, enough to fill a five-volume collection with programmatic texts, articles, pamphlets. Uh, his 1915, From Futurism and Cubism to Suprematism, begins like this. Only when the habit of seeing depictions of little bits of nature, Madonnas and shameless Venuses in paintings disappears, only then will we witness a pure work of art. Of course, he was being somewhat facetious because you see the pure work of art by his definition had already been created. He had created it. The new style based on monochromatic geometric shapes was independent from nature. Every painting represent, representing precisely fuck all. <laughs> the, black, the black square itself was his manifesto made real. Not an abstract person, thing, or emotion, only the purity of the void, or perhaps transcendence. A completely objectless creation, and which he called a holy infant who came into the world to save it from painting. <laughs> it is not surprising then that, that the, at the exhibition, Malevich scandalously displayed it in the red corner under the ceiling where the icons of the Trinity and the Virgin would hang in every Orthodox household. The first human created art by mimicking his own stick figure likeness, and all subsequent visual art was stuck with the idea of copying reality onto, onto a two-dimensional surface. Futurism and cubism are attempts to escape this prison, yet by insisting on portraying things, they remain beholden to them. In other words, cubism and futurism destroyed the thing as a whole. Suprematism went farther and destroyed the thing. Malevich is livid that he's the only one who sees this truth. Yes, <laughs> glory to the futurists. Glory to the futurists who did away with the painting of portraits, female parts, and moonlit guitars. But, but at the same time, yesterday we defended futurism, today we proudly spit upon it. This dialectic took Casimir into the Russian Revolution, a time for radical self-expression, if there ever was one, quite literally burning the man. He, he, he emerged on the other side, still spitting vitriol. The social revolution, Having, having broken the chains of capitalist slavery has not yet broken the old commandments of aesthetic value. And religion and art should be destroyed because they are imaginary phenomena, but they can only be destroyed through the destruction of the state. To Marx, <laughs> to Marx art, artists were a consequence of the class system. Under communism, there would be no artists, just people making art, or memes. Uh, yet communism was somehow slow to come, and Malevich became a respected artist in the new regime. Here, for a time, radical artists were in a unique position. Perhaps for the first time in history, they weren't marginalized. In 1918, after a series of paintings, Malevich presented White on White. The first real... The first real monochrome painting, it overhangs the precipice where painting ceases to exist. Two years later, in 1920, the last room at his solo exhibition held only blank canvases. A declaration of the end of art and at the same time of endless possibility. Was there anywhere else to go from here? Uh, Malevich didn't feel the need to take the final plunge, but his rival, the constructivist Rodchenko, did it for him in 1921. Uh, quote, I reduced painting to its logical conclusion and exhibited three canvases, red, blue, and yellow. I affirmed, this is the end of painting. <laughs> Rodchenko's ideas seem familiar, yet somehow more utilitarian, more constructive. Uh, down with art, long live technical science. Or perhaps Malevich was wary of satire reaching up 
from the depth of art history. I present to you the 1884 uh, apoplectic cardinals harvesting tomatoes on the shore of the Red Sea. <laughs> by Alphonse Allais, uh, which was founded in April Fool's album. Uh, th the 20s were an exciting time in the Soviet Union, communes, free love, gender equality, eat the rich, but, but the writing was on the wall. The Soviet state, the Soviet state as it turned out, wasn't really with avant-garde. It was too prophetic, too didactic, too ideological, and in these things, it competed directly with the Communist Party. In red corners across the land, Virgin Marys were replaced with photographs of Lenin, Stalin, and Marx, not works of geometrical abstraction. As if sensing a change in the wind, in 1928, around the time when Miro declared his desire to assassinate art, um, Malevich returned to figurative painting. Uh, as an act of rebellion, he backdated many of these new paintings with dates from his suprematist period. Um, also, the, this, this paint, painting is called The Peasant, and um, this sort of portrayal of the face is very common in um, Christian iconography. It's, it's the uh, face of Jesus, right? So he is inserting these little bits uh, these little rebellions into his work. Here's another. Uh, this is a self-portrait painted two years before he died. Uh, this was in uh, 1933. And um, super realist. Um, and you, but there's a tiny little fuck you right here. Can you see it? It's, 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 the, it's the black square. Uh, so... Um, De <laughs> right, death, death from cancer in 1935 probably kept Malevich out of the gulags. Uh, he never lived to see the official denunciation of formalist art in the Soviet press, uh, that is art concerned with form without revolutionary or proletarian context. Abstract artists were accused of not being able to draw, from be being divorced from the people, and the avant-garde was relegated to the underground once again. It would, of course, be hard to find an art movement more formalist than suprematism. Malevich himself was crossed out of Soviet art history until the late 80s, along with many others who failed to transition to social realism. His final act of defiance was his funeral, which he had planned in meticulous detail <laughs> during the months leading up to his death. Above his deathbed was placed a black square. This is a modern mixed media piece called The Corpse of Art. <laughs> he was buried in a suprematist coffin that he had designed uh, with the square and the circle on it. Dressed, he was dressed in the three colors of suprematism, white, black, and red. There was a black square placed on the radiator of the hearse and on the train car that transported the body. If there was any doubt, a black square was also placed on his monument. <laughs> Had Malevich gone to meet his maker or his own creation? Well, neither. He went back to the mud, an object no longer. So, art is dead. Long live art. Thank you, Andre, and I wanted specific specifically to thank you for somehow managing to include a Spinal Tap reference in a work on a modern art. Well done. I get to go through the slides beforehand every time when I was flipping through, flipping through. Oh, yes, he went there. <laughs> All right, coming up next, we have the second of our two new speakers for this evening. Christina Liu is going to talk about eggnog. Fight for your riot to party. Christina.
I need an adult. I got it. <laughs> Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. All right. Hi. Hey. Hello. I'm Christina. I'm going to talk to you about the eggnog riot. So, it happens on December 24th to December 25th in 1826 at the North Barrack at West Point Academy. Total of about a third of the cadets were involved, 260, so that would be like 90 cadets. To give you a little bit of context of what was going on at the time in the country, John Quincy Adams was the president. <laughs> There's only, yeah. <laughs> There's only 24 stars on that flag, and Hamilton, the guy in the corner over there, was a guy that just died and not a musical yet. So in the 1700s, eggnog, in addition to being a Christmas drink, it was also an incredibly patriotic drink. George Washington famously has a recipe that is basically half alcohol. It has, yeah, he was a lush. So it has rye rum, sherry, and brandy, in addition to the milk, sugar, and eggs. So. So in England, this drink was incredibly expensive and out of touch for most of the people. But in the United States, we had access to milk, eggs, and a very healthy trade with the Caribbean at the time for rum and sugar. West Point, formerly known as the United States Military Academy, was established in March 16th on 1802 by Thomas Jefferson as the Academy. This is the longest running military outpost in the United States. This is a very prestigious military academy and has an acceptance rate about only 10%. But it wasn't always a prestigious military place. It was very rough and tumble. So Thomas Jefferson tasked this fella, <laughs> Colonel Sylvanus Thayer, to turn the image around. And with a name like Sylvanus, you know he's going to be a hard ass. So, he's also known as the father of West Point, and to turn the image around of the academy, he prohibited alcohol, Ooh. intoxication, Ooh. cooking in your dorm, <laughs> and dueling. Yeah. But, he was a man that loved science, yeah. and math, yeah. and engineering. And so, he made these subjects the core of, of the curriculum at West Point. He actually has a lizard named after him, the Eastern <laughs> Fence Lizard. Yeah. So, so, he expected nothing but excellence from the staff and the students there. He actually handpicked all of the staff and the students. And he made all the students pre-sign letters of resignation just in case of expulsion. Hard ass. So, there used to be a tavern on campus called North Tavern, but he bought it and turned it into a hospital. <laughs> December 22nd, William R. Burnley, Alexander Center, and Samuel Alexander Roberts, as portrayed um, by these fellows here, they were determined to have a Christmas rager. They were denied alcohol at their July 4th party. I know. <laughs> so they took a boat, tiny ship, and sailed it across the Hudson River to Martin's Tavern to buy four gallons of whiskey. <laughs> they actually got caught as they were doing this, and they paid the guard a whopping 35 cents, or $7.50 in today's money, as a bribe. December 23rd, business as usual, nothing crazy happens. The cadets basically just start sneaking away food in their rooms for the party later, and this is when the South Hall catches rumors of the impending party that's about to happen. Now Thayer, he's no idiot. He figures that Christmas Eve, the cadets probably have alcohol squirreled away in their houses, or in their uh, dorms. 
So he assigns Captain Ethan Alling Hitchcock and Lieutenant William A. Thornton to monitor the barracks. It's pretty quiet that night, and so they decide to go to bed at midnight. Four hours later, Hitchcock wakes up and hears partying a few floors above in room 28. So he goes to break it up. He finds six boys drunk and singing, and two of them asleep. So what he does is he reads them the riot act, which stated that the group was congregating unlawfully and could be punished, and made them go to their rooms. So the boys, they decided their party wasn't over. They waited for Hitchcock to go to bed, and they doorbell ditch him. They doorbell ditch him three times. <laughs> by the third time, <laughs> by the third time, <laughs> so by the third time Hitchcock got awoken, he heard another party going on. So he goes to check on what the hell is happening. So he catches two cadets hiding under a blanket. <laughs> and one cadet using a hat as a mask to conceal his identity. So Hitchcock then demands to see the cadet's face, but was interrupted by a louder, rowdier party from downstairs. So he gives up on this one and goes to stop the other one. Now these cadets are upset that their party is interrupted, and one of the cadets claims, get your dirks and bayonets and pistols if you have them. Before this night is over, Hitchcock will be dead. <laughs> so as Hitchcock is going downstairs, he sees Jefferson Davis. Yes, future president of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis, drunk in the hallway, just leaving the party. Jefferson Davis turns around and yells into the room, put away the grog boys, Cap oh, Captain Hitchcock is coming. So Hitchcock then orders Davis back to his room. Now Davis is known for being a lush. He once fell down a ravine because he was so drunk. So what does Davis do when demanded by his officer breaking up a party? He complies, he goes to his room, and that's what basically saves him from being court-martialed. Now Thayer, oh wait, no, Thornton. Thornton is also running around breaking up parties and he actually has a rougher time of it. He has a cadet threaten him with a sword and another one hit him with a piece of wood, <laughs> WWE style. So by this time, Hitchcock is returning to his room and he's got cadets following him. So he goes and locks, it, locks himself in his room. <laughs> Now the cadets are at this point pounding on the door, trying to break it open to get at Hitchcock. One of the cadets pulls out their pistol and opens fires. The bullet goes into the door jam only because he was jostled by another cadet. So when Hitchcock hears the bullet, he realizes that this is too much for just him and Thornton to be able to deal with. He then proclaims, bring the comms. By comms, he meant the commandant of cadets, William Worth. The cadets thought he wanted the, bo the bombardiers, which were the artillerymen. So what the cadets do, and this is when all hell breaks loose, the cadets start taking up arms to defend themselves. They start destroying things. They break windows, they break furniture, they pull banisters out of the wall. And in the chaos, Thornton gets knocked out cold. He actually awakens later in his room because someone took him there. This all basically ends just in time for the 605 Reveille. At this point, you can still hear cadets drinking and partying. And some of them decide to go in line of formation anyways. But you can tell who's been clearly drinking and who's been sleeping all night. So... Now they, they are tasked, Alexander Maycomb, to figure out what was going on. So he places two orders, one on December 26, uh, order number 98, which places 22 cadets under house arrest. And on December 30th, he orders the Inquisition to find out the key players and who started the riots. 
The inquiry was a total of 167 witnesses and, said, and stated that $168.83, which is about $3,600 worth of damages, were made. From these inquiries came court martials, 20 cases, January 24th to March 16th in 1827. These court martials were such a big deal that they went all the way up to the Secretary of War and the President, John Quincy Adams. May 3rd, <laughs> May 3rd is when John Adams closed the case, cl closed all the cases. So 19 cadets were expelled and one soldier, Private John Dugan, was sentenced to one month hard labor and no whiskey. <laughs> the riots actually affected how the barracks in 1840 were built. These barracks were built without interior floor-to-floor -floor access anymore. If you look at this building, there's a funny-looking window in the corner. That's a door. So there must have been stairs there at one point. This barrack is still standing on the campus called the Ordnance Compound Barracks. So not many people know about this, even the students, the alum, and staff at West Point. They've done a great job at covering it up. I found this because I was actually looking for an re eggnog recipe. Oh. So I would like to raise a toast to serendipity and the, and the uncovering of sweet, sweet cover-ups. Thank you, Christina, uh, for a patriotic expression that I think we can all get behind. All right, next up. A speaker who may be familiar to some of you. Uh, Annetta Black will be telling us about William Bly's 3,800 mile revenge. Annetta. Hi, everyone. All right, talk to the middle of the microphone. Do you remember how to do this? I'm not sure. We'll see. <laughs> I have a new clicker, so anything's possible. Okay, so tonight, at the end of this evening where we had a lot more art than, than usual, which, wow, everyone, that was awesome. Thank you, guys. I want to take it back to one of uh, the most famous mutinies that any of us have heard of. It may be, in fact, the most famous mutiny of all, but first... I have a little diversion. I'd like to introduce you to a badass. This young man here is Louis Martin, possibly Louis Martin, I'm not totally sure. He made his own name, so he could be uh, kind of either way. He was born in 1913 in Massachusetts, and he went on to lead a life of extraordinary adventure. He was a globe-trotting explorer. He was a writer, a filmmaker, a diver, a navigator, and a linguist. As a teenager, for fun, he taught himself five languages, including ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. He also became a pioneer in color photography. In 1932, at the age of 19, he wrote a book called Color Photography with a Miniature Camera, which led to him being hired by National Geographic, for which he produced some very colorful images. <laughs> this is apparently the main lobster girls in the 1950s. I really, really dig those outfits. Um, <laughs> Among other adventures over his life, he sailed with Jacques Cousteau on the Calypso. In Madagascar, he discovered an intact egg specimen of the extinct elephant bird, once the world's largest bird, that still had the embryonic skeleton of the unborn chick inside. There is a rare orchid that he discovered, named after him, and it's quite pretty. He worked for NASA, he flew ultralight planes, and he lived here in this amazing house designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Later in life, after he retired, he and his mathematician wife sailed the course that Christopher Columbus took and suggested a different landing place than the traditional narrative holds. And in 1957, he was the one that found the wreck of the HMS Bounty. This is how I first came to know this story. I grew up with shelves full of National Geographics in my house, inherited from my grandparents. And in the December 1957 issue, Martin recounted his expedition to the remote island of Pitcairn in search of the HMS Bounty, burned in the bay by, mountain, by not mountaineers, mutineers <laughs> in 1790. Very different. Um, the waters were dangerous, and reportedly the locals told him it was even crazy to try. But eventually, they found the site in relatively shallow waters. 
And I've reread that article so many times over the years, and it really is. I encourage you all to find a copy of it. It's online. It really is an example of the excellence of this magazine in its heyday and such a, a powerful example of first-person narrative. I continue to be inspired by it. And it was from this story that I first learned the story of the famous mutiny. By a show of hands, how many of you are familiar with the basic outline of the, the mutiny on the bounty? A little more than, little more than half? A, little, a lot of people. It may be the single most famous naval, naval mutiny in history, and it has everything. It has an ill-fated, kind of stupid mission, an evil tyrant of a captain. It has sexy native girls and bold and dashing young sailors. And it all makes for a perfect setting for a righteous uprising and the start of a utopian escape to a world, uh, escape from the world to a remote yet weirdly luxurious tropical island. <laughs> it should probably surprise no one here that most of this is wrong. The bounty was real, the mutiny happened, but the story has been warped through retellings to the point where it's almost unrecognizable. So a few, a few quick facts about the actual, the actual trip and the mutiny. The bounty was a tiny ship. It was a retrofitted cutter built in 1784. She was 90 feet long and she had three masts and she was among the smallest of the warships, the smallest category of warships in the British Navy. And she carried no Marines. This is an important fact that will come up later. Her mission was the pursuit of breadfruit on the island of Tahiti, thought to be an ideal potential crop stable for the British slaves held in the, in the West Indies. And it's interesting to note that this, this adventure happens long after slavery was illegal in the British Isles, but they still kept slavery until 1833 in the, in the uh, West Indies. Yeah, um, this mercantile expedition was not the idea of the Navy, even though it was their ship. This idea was from Joseph Banks, the famous naturalist who had sailed on James Cook's first expedition and who is now the president of the Royal Society back in London. The Navy, fresh out of wars at the moment, decided to offer up a small ship and some otherwise unoccupied sailors for the expedition. Ships, well, ship in this case, one small cutter that they weren't using at the moment. The man in command of this mission was William Bly, a name that has gone down in history. He was an experienced captain of previous, of previous commands and he had sailed on James Cook's less uh, happy ending third rather more disastrous expedition. Uh, but he was not captain of the bounty. The bounty didn't have a captain. The commander of a cutter has the rank of lieutenant. So in order to take this command, it was actually both a pay cut and a reduction of rank for him to take this. But he took it because it was an opportunity to make his name in the world. The bounty was... <laughs> The bounty was crewed by 46 men, 44 naval men, and two civilian botanists charged to take care of the breadfruit that they were going to bring back. Most of the men were under 30. Bly was just 33 years old. They set sail from England in, in 18, sorry, 1787, intending to sail west and under, the Cape, and under Cape Hope to Tahiti. But when they got there, after five months at sea, they encountered such harsh weather that they actually had to turn back and retrace their steps and sail east and go under the Cape of Good Hope. <laughs> Understandably, no one was happy about this situation. Um, so they stopped and did a supply and repair stop in South Africa and another one in Australia, and they finally arrived in Tahiti in October of 1788, just about a year after they had left England. And it was everything that they had hoped for. The land was lush, the natives were accommodating and exceptionally friendly, the sheltered waters were calm, the coconuts were delicious. The men settled, it, settled in, the botanists went to work preparing the breadfruit trees for transport, and they ended up staying in Tahiti for five months. As much as all of the men of the bounty enjoyed the reprieve of duties and the lushness of the land, what really sold them on it was the ladies. The young women of Tahiti and the Tahitian society in general was extremely libertine and free by any European standard. Sex was frequent and casual with no obligations or attachments required. Most of the men spent as much time as possible drunk and in the company of lovely young ladies. It was a lifestyle to be envied. By February, the breadfruit plants were almost ready and they began loading a thousand plants onto the bounty. On the 1st of April, Sad, sad sailors, packed back up and set sail for home. The men, having grown accustomed to their new lifestyles and lovers, were loath to leave, and the very first desertion plan was actually before they actually managed to set sail, and was thwarted just before departure. 
On the route home, relationships started to go south. Bly and his men began to spiral downhill. In particular, the relationship between Fletcher, Fletcher Christian and Bly, despite being very friendly on the original expedition, turned notably sour. Small altercations led to recriminations. Recriminations led to plotting. And then, in the wake of some petty theft on board, at his wit's end, exasperated, Bly cut off the rum supply. It's on April 27th. The mutiny came the next morning on April 28th. <laughs> Less than a month since they had left Tahiti. It was led by Fletcher Christian and apparently unopposed. Bly was taken in his nightshirt and brought trust onto deck. The mutineers lowered the ship's launch um, a small rowboat with a, with a mast, and ordered Bly and any men loyal to him on board. Now, it's worth pointing out that there were so many men that were loyal to Bly, they couldn't all actually fit onto the launch, and the mutineers required a few very skilled men to stay behind because otherwise they couldn't sail the ship without them. So Bly and 18 of the loyal men were crammed onto this 23-foot longboat. And now, as uh, James pointed out earlier, this space above me is about 20 feet long, so that's just three feet longer than that space. 19 men. They were provisioned generously by the mutineers with about one week's worth of rations. Four cutlasses, a tool chest, one sextant, one compass, and no maps or, or charts of any kind. They were cut loose and set adrift. 19 men on a tiny boat settled low in the water about seven inches above the sea approximately 30 miles from the closest land. The bounty turned around and set sail back to the friendly shores of Tahiti. The first thing the men on the launch did was head for that closest island called Tafua. They successfully landed and began stashing food supplies, but within a week they found themselves on the receiving end of a hostile ambush. Grabbing everything they could, they made a break for the launch, and then in the effort to untie the tiny boat from the shore, one man was seized and stoned to death. His body was dragged off right in front of all of the men on the launch, and the Tofuans clacked stones together in a threatening sound, warning anyone else that dared come back ashore. Horrified, everyone on the launch rode and rode and watched the violent death of their comrade and could do nothing. Bly vowed at that moment not to go ashore again, even if they passed other islands, until he reached the European-held territories in the East Indies. Calculating the possible distance in his head and relying on the memory of maps he drew on the Cook expedition, he uh, did the math and immediately imposed brutal rations, a mouthful of food a day, augmented primarily with rainwater. So before I go any further, I want to return to that tiny vessel. And I'd like you to take a moment and close your eyes and imagine yourself stuffed onto a glorified rowboat, shoulder to shoulder, closer than you're sitting now, with 17 terrified companions. You've just seen one man die. You realize the de desperate situation you face, tropical heat, tropical storms. It is unbelievably cramped and hot you are facing starvation almost immediately. Everyone is in a shitty, terrible mood all the time, and there is nowhere to go. And beyond you, the vastness of the sea. As they made their miserable way across the southern seas, Bly kept a cramped journal of the voyage and drew new maps. Um, most importantly, a list of the names and the description of each of the mutineers. Because he wasn't just taking this terrible little boat to safety, he wasn't just rescuing his men, he was getting revenge on the assholes who had taken his ship. Over the next six weeks, using celestial navigation, dead reckoning, and memory, William Bly led his increasingly agitated and unhealthy men over an estimated 3,800 nautical miles of open sea. By contrast, Ernest Shackleton's extraordinary story of survival that is often cited off, off of Antarctica was 720 nautical miles. 3,800 nautical miles is the equivalent of about 4,400 land miles. So to give you perspective, that is essentially the distance from where we are now in San Francisco to Lima, Peru. No stops, mouthful of food. Finally, on June 14th, it's a week from now, Bly raised an improvised Union Jack made of shreds of clothing and sailed into the Dutch settlement of Kupang Harbor in Indonesia. Starving on the edge of insanity and death, all 18 men who had left Tafua survived to see Kupang. 
and then four promptly dropped dead. <laughs> Turns out starvation and, and all those things are really, really, really bad for you. Um, in the aftermath, Bly returned to England where he was exonerated of any wrongdoing and hailed as a hero and a survivor. The British Navy dispatched a ship, the HMS Pandora, to search for mutineers in Tahiti. Bly was the hero of his own story. He had successfully made his reputation as an officer and as a gentleman and a badass on the bounty voyage. Or so he thought. But meanwhile, back on the bounty, things had gone downhill swiftly. As it turns out, at least in this case, a bunch of men motivated primarily by the dream of a dissolute, a dissolute life of drunkenness and vice turn out to be crappy long-term companions. So there's a whole other somewhat Schadenfreude-filled story here, but quickly, in a nutshell, the bounty and its 25 men set sail in the end not for Tahiti, but for the island of Tibuai, reasoning that it was like far enough away from Tahiti to avoid search parties, but still able to go there if they needed ladies. Um, and it was certain to be just as accommodating. But as it turns out, not so much. They got a very hostile reception almost immediately. Eventually, they went back to Tahiti, in theory, to resupply, resupply, uh, where the natives were kind of actually really tired of them. They had had their fun, and they had seen the last of them, and they weren't ready to have them back anytime soon. And it was pretty quickly made clear that they weren't welcome back in any kind of a long-term way. Sixteen of the men decided that they wanted to stay ashore, regardless. And so they were left ashore uh, after the remainder of the men promised that they would take the bounty away. That night, the men still on the ship held a rollicking party on the ship and invited all the pretty girls. And then abruptly set sail, taking captives of 20 Tahitians. They eventually dropped six of them off on another island because the mutineers decided that they had no use for elderly ladies. The bounty finally found its home on the remote island of Pitcairn, and the reason they chose it is that it had been conveniently mislocated on the maps of the era. It was about 180 miles off from where it appeared on the charts, so they thought they might be safe. But to ensure that they stayed there and that they were really committed to this gig, and this was the final destination, Fletcher Christian and the rest of the mutineers set fire to the bounty in the shallow waters of the bay. And with that, they disappeared. The location of the ship and the men became a mystery to the outside world. So at this point, with a certain fate, level of fate uncertain, I'd like to say that when deciding who is the hero and who is the bad guy, it's important to remember who wrote the story and what they had to prove. In Bly's mind, and in the immediate aftermath of the court-martials, he was a hero, the star of an incredible, unlikely voyage, a survivor and a savior of his men. It was not until years later that his reputation began to slide. And partially, that was legitimately on him. Although he was a relatively reasonable and non-tyrannical captain by the, by the standards of the day, um, by most personal accounts and any reasonable comparison with other captains, later on in his career, he became known for being stern and disciplinarian and was unlikable. And in the end, his career was marred not by one, but two further mutinies. <laughs> but at least some, if not most, of the blame has come from depictions of Bly in fiction and film, where he's been turned from an unpopular and kind of grumpy captain who didn't want to indulge in the, the licentiousness of his men into a ruthless tyrant for the sake of plot lines. The mutineers, in turn, got something of a polish. Their desires to break free from the domineering life of the Navy in favor of a free love, tropical utopia seem somewhat reasonable, if not to be envied. But in reality, the mutineers pretty much to a one turned out to be the real villains in this story. Not only were they basically drunken louts in general, not only were they Navy men who rose up against their commanding officers on relatively trivial matters, not only did they set those commanding officers adrift with meager rations expecting them to meet their death, not only that, but they kidnapped young men and women to effectively be their slaves, sexual and otherwise, in their new tropical paradise. And in the end, that tropical paradise swiftly became a hellscape of vitriol, suicide, and mass murder. Fletcher Christian, in fact, was among the first to die at the hands of his Tahitian captives. By the time the settlement at Pitcairn was finally discovered in 1808, only one mutineer had survived, basically by being the most ruthless asshole amongst ruthless assholes. I feel the need to point out that his name was John Adams. <laughs> There's a two for tonight. Also, the town on Pitcairn is named for him. It's Adamstown. So, way to go down in history. Uh, 
And the other mutineers, the ones that went back to Tahiti and stayed there, two of them had already been murdered by the time the HMS Pandora caught up with them and arrested the survivors to bring them to stand trial. And shortly thereafter, the Pandora sunk, taking with them 31 of the crew and four of the 14 prisoners still chained below the decks. Of the men that returned to England, most of them were found guilty of the crime of mutiny. A few of them were loyal to Bly and were pardoned, and they faced death by hanging. So I'd like you to consider this. Bly was a jerk, absolutely, but his memory has also been unfairly maligned. The mutineers have mostly gone down in history as if not the good guys, and at least the ones that you would prefer to have a drink with. But as it turns out, they were actually very much in pretty much all the ways the bad guys in this story. And paradise is often not what it's cracked up to be. And I think there's something important here that we've seen over and over and over again that the history books don't really explicitly state, but that seems obvious in context, and that's that jerks in history have something very inherently in common. It takes a certain kind of person to live a life of bold adventure, to leave your partner and beloved children, as Bly did, at home for a multi-year mission with uncertain promise of, of return, and it takes a certain kind of person to decide that that first person is unreasonable and to rise up in mutiny, steal a ship, and set men adrift. Mostly not nice people. So maybe you don't have to be a jerk to go down in history, but I'm going to suggest that it doesn't hurt. And I also think this. There is a relative scale of jerks, and a jerk can still be a hero who saved the lives of 17 men who mostly didn't even like him that much. But I also think that what this story has taught me is that there's also room in history for different kinds of explorers and tellers of stories who live extraordinary lives of adventure and curiosity, inspiring others through action and words, and who may have actually worn cufflinks made of nails from the bounty. So I would like to raise my glass to remembering that history is complicated and it's important to not whitewash the stories and recognize the jerks that came before us. Thank you, Anetta. Thank you. And thank all of you. This has been a fantastic night. Um, coming up next, join us here in two weeks. Am I right this time? One week. One week. I was thrown off by this one. For Crackpot. Which is kind of a gimme with this crowd. Um, and followed in uh, two weeks after that by Stolen on the 11th. Oops which uh, we don't have a slide for. It's just, it says stolen. Just <laughs> stolen. It was stolen, obviously. Yay. Y'all are so good to me. Uh, also, join the ongoing conversation at Something Weird on Facebook, where we'll be posting our follow-up reading lists for tonight and links related to tonight. We welcome you to, always, as always, join us and share stories and inspiration there as well. Um, I also want to thank all of our speakers because everyone did an amazing job. Can I get a round of applause for all the speakers? Did you? No, okay. Uh, I also wanted to give a couple of personal thanks. Um, uh, Max, who is the house sound guy, who is doing my job tonight. Give it up for Max. Thank you for making it so that I could actually do this. Uh, I want to personally thank Audrey and Becca who put up with me after me realizing on Sunday that I had to rewrite everything that I had done. <laughs> and uh, I also want to thank Annetta for giving me the opportunity to do this, to sit in the comfy chair and to learn all kinds of weird crap that I could not tell you about tonight, so I'll be telling you at a future Odd Salon. So. Stick around, uh, get to the merch table, get some merch, get tickets for the next shows at a discount, uh, keep drinking, keep hanging out, and anything else? Yeah, one more thing. One more thing. So um, our uh, currency here at Odd Salon is booze and books. And so I have, first of all, I, we also have one of tonight's customer Harveys for you, Steen. <laughs> Thank you, Isolde. And then um, I have a copy of, um, in addition to that article that I read so many years ago, there's a book called Captain Bly's Portable Nightmare, which is specifically about the journey on the 23-foot uh, launch. And so I got you a copy of that. I think it's long out of print, but. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. So please, everyone, join me in raising a final glass of the evening or giving a big round of applause if that drink is empty to Steen and his curation. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Get a drink. Chat amongst yourselves.